Welcome. My name is Caroline Humer. I'm a correspondent at Reuters, and I'm also today's moderator. Um, today, we are going to be talking about uh, what comes next. Yesterday, we saw the collapse of the latest Republican effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. The decision not to vote on the Graham-Cassidy bill was the latest development in a, a host of activity that also saw Democrats refocus on a single-payer proposal. Um, you know, this, this morning the president was tweeting that, you know, uh, there were some prospects for a health care repeal vote after all. Um, and so we've brought some experts here to talk about what, what could be next in this picture. So we'll start here from my immediate right. We have Robert Blendon, professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. To his right, Sheila Burke, Chair of the Government Relations and Public Policy Group at Baker Donaldson, also Adjunct Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and Senior Advisor to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Next to her is Robert Moffat. He's a Senior Fellow at the Heritage Foundation Center for Health Policy Studies and John McDonough, Professor of the Practice of Public Health at the Harvard Chan School. Joining us from California, Lan He Chen, Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution and Director of Domestic Policy Studies and Lecturer in the Public Policy Program at Stanford University. Today's event is presented jointly with Reuters. We're streaming live on the website of the forum and of Reuters, and we're also streaming on Facebook. The program will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. So before we hear from our panelists, let's take a look at some of the activity that we've had around the ACA that's led up to today. We're going to see a clip now that relates a little bit to the Graham-Cassidy bill. We now know that won't be voted on, <laughs> but we'll still listen because some of those ideas are probably going to come back again. And we're also, we're also talking here in our clip about the Democrats' renewed efforts on the single-payer proposal, uh, you know, one where the government would um, you know, cover everyone's health care costs. Uh, the clip is from Reuters TV, and we'll see that now. Just when it seemed the push for health reform had flatlined on Capitol Hill, senators on the right and left offering dueling plans Wednesday to keep it alive. Republicans led by Senator Lindsey Graham making a last-ditch effort to salvage the GOP effort that collapsed over the summer. There's a lot of fight left in the Republican Party when it comes to repealing and replacing Obamacare. And Senator Bernie Sanders unveiling his plan for universal health care. Health care in America must be a right, not a privilege. Karen Bohan is following this story. What we saw today is that even as Republicans are still trying to get rid of Obamacare, the Bernie Sanders bill would envision an even bigger role for government in health care. Republicans criticized Obamacare as a government intrusion into the health care system, but Obamacare relied on private health care insurance largely. The Medicare for All plan would be government-run health insurance. Sanders' proposal given no chance of passing Congress with Republicans in control. But the plan seen as an opening salvo in the Democrats' bid to retake the White House in 2020, with potential candidates Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and Kamala Harris from the Senate all embracing it. Hell no to Bernie Care. On the Republican side, Graham and co-sponsor Senator Bill Cassidy offering a new alternative after some rejected the massive cuts to Medicaid in the earlier plan to overturn Obamacare. It's a last-ditch effort to do that, and that plan would turn over the responsibility for providing health care to the states. Under the new plan, states would each get a set amount of federal money for Medicaid, known as a block grant, but that money would be capped and phased out by 2027. Skepticism already running high, critics saying the plan still doesn't do enough to protect the old and the poor. I guess we'll start now. Um, those are two vastly different views there. And we need to take a look at how Republicans and, and Democrats uh, view this topic. And Bob, I know you've done some polling. Tell us what you found. 
Uh, so quickly, my apologies to the audience. Uh, when you talk about public opinion, it never corresponds to the front page of the newspaper. <laughs> and so it, life's a little more complex. So uh, I'm going to uh, briefly summarize uh, where the picture is, show you very, very quickly just what squiggly lines look like, uh, and, and then it really opens up to my colleagues. Uh, the f first thing is to disappoint to everybody, uh, for people in the hinterland, the debate over the future of the ACA is not over. Sorry, it, they don't know they should know it's over. Uh, uh, secondly, what really changed in the United States in the last years is a commitment to not dropping the 30 million people from coverage. Overwhelming. Uh, don't do that. An unbelievable commitment to if you have a pre-existing condition, you have to be covered. But they did not fall in love with the ACA. And that's where people are getting this uh, all mixed up. And you'll see in a minute, uh, with a group of Democrats uh, actually have this 2020 thing in their eyes, they should rub them or something, but they're really cheering for where, somewhere where Bernie's going. So uh, we are likely to keep having, which I'll show you quickly, a debate about an it. There is no agreement on what that it should look like, uh, but there'll be a lot of people who are going to want an alternative to something called the ACA. So let's just do this uh, uh, quickly. So this was done after the first Senate vote, uh, where they could not reach agreement. Headline says, everything dead, go home. And uh, you ask people what they want. Number one, go try it again uh, for this. Uh, you notice the parties don't completely agree. Uh, uh, for this. So when people talk about bipartisan, we hold our hands, we sing songs together. I can't find that uh, on, in these tables. You'll find it later in the discussions uh, uh, for that. So the thing you have to know about this, uh, people gave Republicans uh, a, a list of things that the president talked about that Congress should do. And what they wanted to see is taxes now, taxes now. Damn it. What turned up was change the health care bill now, way above the taxes. So we're now all running around doing taxes. That isn't what the people in the Pico Turnpike were, were telling pollsters. So on the Republican side, they, they, they uh, want some alternative. Uh, basically, let's uh, uh, quickly look about what didn't change with the ACAA. Next slide. Uh, so uh, this is over a period of time. It's an average of all, all the polls. But basically, America is divided about whether or not they kind of like it or not. Next, but they're not divided. And this is the historic slide. Uh, essentially, what that shows you is over a short period of years, uh, the minority of Americans became the majority, basically saying you can't take coverage away from people who have it. That's really what the slide says. Uh, I don't know about what plan I like. You cannot take it away from 30 million uh, people. On the question of my pre-existing conditions, we are at the 80% level across all parties. You cannot take that away from people. So we did not fall in love with the ACA. I'm sorry, we didn't. We fell in love with you just can't take those cards away from 30 million people and, and pre-existing conditions. Who are the 40? So the 40 who still don't believe are mostly Republicans, but it turns out half of them said, I don't like this, but you can't reduce the Medicaid coverage. You just can't do that. 80% of them said you can't take pre away pre-existing conditions. So uh, the last is just quickly about the change that goes on. You don't watch the weather except the hurricanes, but watch what happened in U.S. health policy weather. Next slide. Uh, so it's a long-standing question. What do you want? Would you rather have a private health insurance system for everybody in America, or would you rather have a, essentially an all-government system? And suddenly it starts to move. Uh, uh, for this, uh, last slide. Uh, and is there something here which suggests there's not instant agreement between where we're going as a nation? So what's happening among Democrats, that does not mean they love single payer or they even know what it is or Medicare for all. They are starting to say, I want something where the government has a dominant role. On the Republican side, let's summarize. Uh, I want an alternative. I want it to be private. Uh, uh, for that, I surely don't want a government plan. So the debate is likely co to continue even if it doesn't make it in the next session because the splits are there. And regardless of how much Republicans want to say taxes, taxes, they should not be allowed to talk public to pollsters. And they keep doing something about the health care, something about the health care. So while we're debating taxes, there will be some other debate. Uh, not clear what it will be. And I'm sorry, the Democrats are going to be talking about things that have the G word in it. Again, I don't know what that means. I'm sure the panel will lay that out.
Thanks, Bob. That's a great setup for us, I think. Um, so, well, Sheila, uh, you're a federal public policy expert, and you've looked specifically at the future of health care. And you were also served as chief of staff to Senator Bob Dole and as secretary of the Senate. So why don't you give us your perspective on what's happening here? Well, uh, the thing I would add to Bob's, uh, I think, terrific overview is that as great as the division is between Democrats and Republicans, you can reflect that as well between Republicans. And so one of the challenges, of course, is getting the Republicans to come to consensus, which we've seen over the last few months uh, not to be the case. Uh, but in terms of where we are now and where we might imagine going forward uh, very shortly, and we'll go into these, I'm sure, in great detail, uh, Congress tends to think in short term, long term. Uh, kinds of strategies, that is what needs to be done now, what can we push off and essentially do over a period of time. Um, the complicating question, I think, for today uh, is that health care is not the only issue that's in play here, uh, that there are a whole series of other competing demands that must also be dealt with. Among them, the appropriations bills, which essentially fund all of the other non-entitlement nature uh, programs in the federal government, FDA, CDC, things of that nature. Uh, you've got issues around the budget resolution and essentially what the budget plan is going forward. Little things like the FAA reauthorization. Uh, that's critical to many. All of the demands as a result of the hurricanes in terms of supplemental financing to deal with Puerto Rico, Texas, uh, et cetera. So those are short-term demands. So that McConnell's decision essentially to turn away in the near term to essentially other issues reflects that they have competing priorities in terms of what they need to take home. Uh, and the fact that they essentially have spent months on this, delaying the consideration of a fair number of other issues. So the competing priorities is a huge problem. But in terms of short term, the conversations have already begun about coming back to this question of whether we can agree to short term stabilization for the insurance markets. Uh, we're in a very short time frame because the plans essentially are having to agree or not agree to engage in the exchanges. Uh, they have filed their rates. In some cases, they filed two rates uh, in states, and the states are asking the question in terms of when will we know whether or not the cost-sharing subsidies are going to continue. Not doing so will have an extraordinary impact on essentially premiums uh, in the individual market. So that will be the short-term priority. And they'll be looking at that issue, the CSRs. They'll be looking at other methods of stabilization, whether it's reinsurance funds or other ways to essentially stabilize that market in the near term. They're looking at one, two years to essentially allow time to play to look at some of these other issues. Longer term, there are a whole series of questions that really come back to this question of the federal state responsibility and what the division is among the feds and the states in terms of oversight and responsibility. It touches on the Medicaid program, where that responsibility should lie. It touches on the private insurance market. What flexibility should the states have to build a market for their state to stand down from some of the requirements of the ACA? So longer term, it's waivers, it's guidelines, it's the essential health benefits, that will be discussed. But in the short term, the clear priority is stabilizing the market for 18 and for 19. Great. Thank you. Um, Bob, you're an expert in health policy at the Heritage Foundation, which has supported the repeal of the Affordable Care Act no. in the past. Um, so my question for you is where does the Republican Party go from here? Um, do they stay on health care? Well, I don't think they have any choice. I think this, uh, as uh, Bob said, we're basically in the middle of the 100 years war, and it doesn't make any difference you know, whether you want to do it or not. Uh, there are uh, fundamental problems right now with the individual and the small group market. Those pr markets are, in fact, in grave danger. In the individual market, you're seeing 25% average premium increases. You see a, a rather a sharp decline in competition in the states. Right now, 70% of the counties in the United States only have one or two insurers competing, so they cannot ignore this. This is on their watch. I think where they go from here is, I think certain things are certainly going to happen. Uh, one is, I think that the uh, Alexander Murray bipartisan bill is all of a sudden alive. And uh, that's going to address a number of things. It's going to address the stabilization of the insurance markets, the cost-sharing subsidies. The hard one is going to be uh, this issue of state flexibility and federal authority. I can see this either succeeding or failing, depending upon the ability of the Democrats and the Republicans to compromise on this issue of state authority over their own health insurance markets. I also see a possibility that there could be an agreement on a number of tax reductions. 
uh, or tax eliminations. Uh, there are a lot of very unpopular taxes in the Affordable Care Act. The medical device tax, the Cadillac tax, the so-called Cadillac tax, the tax on uh, health insurance, uh, the tax on drugs. I could see those going away in a bipartisan agreement. And uh, our colleagues over at the Urban Institute, certainly no ideological bedfellow of the Heritage Foundation, they're saying get rid of the employer mandate penalty. So I could see that going as well. I think a good fight is going to be over the individual mandate, and I could see that actually going to the floor in an up or down vote because I think Republicans would want to get Democrats on the record uh, going into 2018 on that. Um, none of this is really predictable, though. There is, of course, the unpredictability of a total, totally predictable unpredictability of Donald Trump, which is, he's already done it. He said, look, if I can't get the Republicans to do what they want, well, maybe I'll cut a deal with Chuck and Nancy. Uh, that's not cr crazy. That's quite possible. He did it on the debt limit. Um, his, um, his support in the public was about 71%, according to the polling, and his uh, overall approval rating jumped up by 43%. Uh, to 43 percent. So this is good for him politically. It's not necessarily good for the Republicans in Congress. Um, the issue about single payer, it's going to be continued to be debated. I think the big issue is going to be the trade-offs, whether uh, you can accept the level of taxation that would be required for that. Uh, I don't think, frankly, that that is going to be a successful debate for the Democrats. But I think I welcome the debate because it's going to give us an opportunity to really clear the air on where we want to go as a country and what kind of health care system we want to have. Uh, so that's where I think things are likely to go. Um, I think that uh, if the Murray Alexander bill fails, I think you're looking at parliamentary guerrilla warfare in Congress. And that means that the Republicans will use any opportunity to make some attack on one or more provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they will use the uh, appropriations process, the budget process. They will use program authorizations, reauthorizations. And believe me, in the Senate, they've got a lot of flexibility to do this. And so I think the Democrats will be on defense on this issue mm -hmm. over the next two, next two years. Okay, thanks. So. John, in addition to your work in public, po public health policy here at the school and elsewhere, you also served as Senior Advisor on National Health Reform for the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and as Executive Director of Healthcare for All, a nonprofit advocacy organization. Um, why don't you give us your take on, on how, this how this lays out? Well, so I'd start, Carolyn, just by thank you for calling us experts and just try to note that I think all of us were wrong probably dozens of times over the past 10 months. Nobody saw this coming Especially the way. Especially in November, right? The way. <laughs> if, anybody, if anybody had thought we would be here right now, right. last November, it's just hard to imagine. And, and the other thing that's clear is, you know, you'd like to have some finality one way or another in terms of repeal and replace, and it looks like we're not going to have that. And so as long as that hangs out there, then we're going to see more stalemate and more of political warfare in terms of going and addressing the urgent things that need to be done to stabilize and improve the market today that are, in fact, doable and achievable. I mean, there's you know, you're driving down the road, your car breaks down, you got two choices. Should I get it fixed or do I need to buy a new car? I think it's pretty clear we don't need to buy a new car. We can make this car work by doing the cost sharing reductions, by doing the market stabilizations. But one of the difficulties we're having right now is that uh, the Trump administration is not exercising benign neglect of the insurance market. It's really exercising, I think, malignant neglect in the sense that they are deliberately pulling out the advertising, they are defunding the navigators that played a crucial role in helping people understand their choices and sign up for coverage. So there's a whole host of things that are going on right now that is a deliberate effort to try to undermine and weaken the markets. And the other thing I'd say, and this is a real tragedy, is that while Congress has been going through this fierce debate over the past two weeks, completely under the radar screen, everybody seems to have forgotten that on Saturday night at midnight, the funding authorization for the Children's Health Insurance Program disappears, mm -hmm. as well as funding authorization for crucial funding for community health centers. I mean, those two things are not controversial in Congress, but because of this warfare, these aren't going to get done 
and anytime soon, and we don't understand yet, I think, or appreciate the consequences of that. So it's a, it's a difficult time to be a health policy expert and think that there are rational solutions where the parties can, in fact, come together and agree on things. Uh, but it looks like, unfortunately, we're going to be seeing continued partisan back and forth, I think, leading essentially to a stalemate until there's some kind of a breakthrough, which is just hard to foresee what that breakthrough would be where they can start really dealing. You'd like to think it could be Senator Murray and Senator Alexander, but even if they were to agree, I'm not sure it could get through the Senate, much less the, much less the House. So I think we're into a really dangerous stalemate. And I think people are unfortunately getting hurt, and I think a lot more people are going to get hurt. I don't think the fundamental law is going away at this point. I think that's going to stand. I think it will be damaged, and it can be salvaged at some point and improved and fixed. But, um, but for the time being, I think we're in a really dangerous and difficult position. And, and just to clarify that Children's Health Insurance Program, that is, uh, CHIP, is uh, about 3 million children, is that right, um, of, of no, low-income parents? I think it's more, it's it's more eight, like it's 8, eight, eight to 10, ten. Yeah. 8 and a half to eight 10 million. million. So yeah. that, that's yeah. a, that is a lot of people. Uh, that's a lot of kids. And yeah, yeah, a lot of kids. Yeah. Some states can hold on. They have enough money. Uh, and some states will be in a uh, very fast, difficult financial situation. And every state has built the expectation of the money coming back into their budget. And, you know, uh, we, we know uh, Senator Hatch has put forward something that's gone nowhere out of finance, and we're not hearing pretty much anything from the House. It's very difficult. An important note, I think, as we, as we turn to Lenny, is that it is one of those programs that has a history of being bipartisan. Right. I mean, it has stood the test of time in large part because it has bipartisan support. Questions about funding levels and things of that nature, but fundamentally, the commitment to essentially care for these kids who are slightly above the Medicaid levels uh, is really one that's been taken by both Democrats and Republicans over a long Thanks. period of time. Um, and we will turn to Lanhe now. Lanhe, thank you so much for joining us. You also are a public policy expert and served as the policy director for the Romney Ryan presidential campaign. Um, I wonder if you could give us uh, your perspective on, on some of these uh, high points that we're discussing. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you from California. It's still morning here, I guess. Um, I, look, I, there's a couple of observations I would, I would make about the period of time that we've all been through, and I think we all uh, are looking forward maybe to a little more sleep now that, uh, you know, hopefully the initial period of discussion around uh, these repeal and replace efforts has ended. I think what this process illustrated and what it exposed is just how much division there is within even the conservative movement, the Republican Party on issues of health care. You know, for seven years, it was very easy for Republicans to simply say, we want to repeal and replace Obamacare, the ACA, without really getting into what that meant. And once we got into this process, what we realized was how difficult it was to square the circle between Ted Cruz and Mike Lee on the one hand and Susan Collins on the other. And when Republicans made the decision to pursue a party line uh, uh, option, when they made the decision to use budget reconciliation to deal with the Affordable Care Act, what became patently obvious was that they just weren't ever going to get there, that you had too big of a divide between, uh, I come back to Susan Collins and John McCain and Lisa Murkowski on the one hand, and, uh, and Ted Cruz on the other. There was not one bill that was going to satisfy all of those players. Now, that having been said, I think where they ended up, which was Graham Cassidy, actually is probably where they should have started. And here's why I say that. There are very few things that draw Republicans together on health policy. One of those issues that they do come together on is federalism. And the notion that states ought to have a bigger role that there was something about the pre-ACA system where the locus of regulation was the state, that I think most Republicans would say, yeah, I can sign up for that. Now, obviously, the devil's in the details. But clearly, the theme of federalism is something that I think most Republicans um, really would agree with. And I think it's something that, had that been a starting point for the conversation, rather than, as we saw with the BCRA and legislation earlier this year, that really tried to kind of change the arc of the ACA, but fundamentally 
uh, you know, didn't do a whole lot necessarily to the regulatory architecture of the ACA. I think if the discussion started somewhere else, maybe we'd end up in a different place. Let me just say briefly also about the debate over single payer health care. Um, I, I think that it will be very interesting to see now how this debate develops and how Republicans engage in this debate. You will recall in the clip that you showed at the beginning of our time together, Lindsey Graham basically made the argument, look, if you want single payer health care, then the status quo is where that's headed. I'm not sure that's a real compelling argument for Republicans to be making. I tend to think that the more compelling argument is to say, look, what are the ways that we can effectuate change to the current system to move us in a more market oriented direction that will be a contrast to single payer health care rather than saying, look, take it or leave it. This is going to be it. Because I don't think that, that most Americans find that to be a compelling argument. I think there are very good reasons to oppose what Senator Sanders has proposed. I think we ought to litigate that as Republicans. Uh, but I'm not sure that the way in which the debate got started was the best way for Republicans to make that case. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and I guess we'll get into a little bit of discussion on these points. Great. Thanks so much. So as, as we've all noted here, the Affordable Care Act remains today the, the law of the land. And um, at the same time, there's a lot of good points about uh, changes that have, to, that have to come that are coming. So perhaps we could just start a little bit by talking about the, the next steps. Um, you know, can, let's go to perhaps this the Alexander Murray bipartisan effort. I mean, is there really hope for a bipartisan outcome? Is that uh, a realistic next step for this very divided um, single payer versus take it to the states uh, sort of um, view that we have here? And maybe we could start with Sheila on this one. Sure. Um, you know, I'm, I want to reflect on a point that Lanny made, which I think is absolutely uh, correct, uh, which is there, it, there is clearly among Republicans this commitment to federalism. Uh, the definition of what that entails varies among Republicans, uh, but there's certainly that commitment. So we, if we think about what the next steps might be, they will be the short term, not the long term steps. It's not the debate over single payer or Medicare for all. It's really two years out. I mean, we're going into a midterm election in 18. We're going into a general election in 20. And the question is, what can you do over the next two years to stabilize rates, to essentially keep people in the market, to essentially keep plans in the market? Uh, and I think there are a host of things. The commitment to CSRs, which is the basis upon which Murray and Alexander have spoken, uh, developing alternatives to the individual mandate. I think Bob raised very appropriately this tension around the individual mandate. And the question is, what is the alternative to essentially encourage people to enroll that avoids the sort of adverse selection that happens uh, when in fact you've got people enrolling because they're sick. There are issues around HSA contributions, using the tax code differently, encouraging people to essentially uh, purchase and giving them a, a greater tax benefit for doing so, uh, increasing state flexibility. There are rules within the ACA on 1332, which is a provision that allows uh, the authority for waivers, similarly to the existing authority under Medicaid. Uh, I think they'll be looking at whether that essentially provides some reassurance to the Republicans while still some protections that the Democrats are concerned about in terms of guardrails for coverage. So I think the near term is that stabilization. What do in fact Republicans need? Bob's absolutely correct. There's a lot of opposition, the House in particular. What reassurance do they need that there is going to begin to be some change or at least the commitment to move in, in direction of change? while essentially you essentially stabilize the market. To Bob's point, no one wants to see 30 million people lose coverage. Uh, and issues around Medicaid, issues around the expansion population, issues around essentially who gets financed, I think all those things will play into that short term. And Bob, maybe you could take the other side of that. And, and maybe first just a quick description of what uh, these cost sharing reductions are. Well, the cost sharing reductions are uh, payments to the uh, health insurance companies uh, to take care of people uh, who need help with their out-of-pocket out costs and their deductibles. Uh, basically, you're talking about two people who are eligible for these or people who get, uh, who fit, it's 250% of poverty. That's right. basically it. Now, just to put that into concrete terms, it's, about, it's somebody making about $15 an hour. So we're talking about, you know, really low-income people. The issue, however, is not the cost-sharing subsidies. I think this is a this is a, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. I don't know anybody, frankly, in Congress who thinks that, you know, 
regardless of their political point of view, that, you know, that as, as a matter of public policy, we ought to ignore the needs of the, either the sick or the poor. I don't think that's the issue. The question is often how are we going to do that, and at the same time, how are we going to make structural changes that will reduce the overall cost of delivering health care? That's the key issue. In the case of the cost-sharing subsidies, there's another problem. And that is that the cost sharing subsidies were basically transferred to the insurance companies without a specific appropriation from Congress. This has already gone to the lower courts. The courts have said basically the House of Representatives is right under the Constitution. You cannot take <coughs> funds out of the Treasury and simply distribute it as a result of <laughs> executive fiat. So I think what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to vote for those cost sharing subsidies. And I think the potential deal here is if there, and I say potential, is going to be rough stuff. The potential deal here is are the Democrats willing to give the states the kind of regulatory flexibility they need to reduce the costs, all right, for their citizens? Under the Affordable Care Act, you basically have two large po populations that are affected directly by the law. You have 20 million people, roughly, who are subsidized either under Medicaid, roughly 12 million people, and about 8 million under the exchange programs, the, the so-called premium uh, exchanges, the premium tax credit program. You have another 10 million who are in the individual market and another 15 million who are in the, in the, in the individual market who are affected by the same regulatory system. The people who are not in the exchanges and not getting the subsidies are the people who are getting hammered hammered by massive t uh, premium increases and frankly crazy deductibles. I'm talking about deductibles on, in the, uh, you know, I think for the silver plan, the standard plan, $3,500 you know, for uh, uh, an individual and $7,500 roughly uh, for family coverage. Well, I mean, this is really tough. And then of course the CBO says, well, you know, the, uh, the individual mandate actually is, is powerful enough to actually expand coverage. One victim of this entire process, I will say, it's not just simply the fact that Republicans, you know, screwed themselves up in this process. CBO damaged them, right, with uh, these reports indicating, you know, that 24 million people or so on would lose coverage. But think about this, ladies and gentlemen. CBO's baseline says that in 2018, there will be 18 million people in the exchanges. Now, if you believe that, you believe the CBO baseline. There are now less than 11 million people in the exchanges. If you believe the CBO baseline, you would then believe the projections about what would happen under any Republican bill with regard to the uninsured, right, or coverage. I think that one of the things that is going to take place as a result of this experience we've had over the past several months is that Congress is going to start looking at CBO closely. Their coverage estimates have been wildly off the mark since 2010. Not slightly off the mark, wildly off the mark. The second thing is, is that they operate on assumptions that most of us have no idea what they're doing. In other words, we don't know what their assumptions are. Transparency and CBO's calculations, how CBO arrives at their estimates, is something that is long overdue. Maybe this debate will actually start to bring that to the fore. So, you know, as we look at this sort of fix effort, um, I wonder if we could uh, talk just for a second about the other things that are, that are going to be going on right now. Parallel to this, we have tax reform. And, uh, you know, with the idea of, of also out there that, you know, health care, that, you know, President Trump tweeting this morning, just, you know, health care, we want to bring it back. Could there be a vote? Um, how do we do, how do we manage all of these? And, and it would be great if, Lan, he, you, you uh, give us your, your, your answer for that. Thank you. <laughs> well, speaking as the, as, the, as the Trump sage of the group, uh, what, what I... Uh, no, what, what, what I would say is this is, this is an exceptionally difficult exercise because, the, first of all, the agenda is very crowded. Uh, obviously, tax reform is something that the president's talking about today. Uh, I do think that uh, the issue there, again, they're running into the same problem around do they want to do it as a unipartisan effort or a bipartisan effort. It seems like they're, they're talking about doing it via reconciliation of the 2018 budget, which I think raises some similar concerns as to the ACA debate. Um, more broadly, though, there's a political question, which is 
how does the Republican Party respond to the political pressure from the base to get something done? And this has always been the big question around ACA repeal and replace. Why is it that Republicans keep coming back to it? Well, you know, Bob pointed this out earlier. This is a huge issue for the Republican base. And if you look, you know, interestingly enough, last night there was an election in Alabama. And Roy Moore, the um, uh, insurgent, let's call him, uh, defeated Mitch McConnell's uh, hand-selected uh, uh, individual, Senator Luther Strange, which suggests that there is a lot of energy in the base that's still very angry at the Republican Party or the establishment Republican Party for failing to have acted on health care. And I think that will carry over into tax reform as well. So they're, they're very much related, tax reform and health care. Some Republicans have said, look, we're going to take another cut at ACA repeal as part of the tax reform effort in 2018. It, that would be a huge mistake in my view, because what you're doing now is you are uh, polluting the waters on tax reform, which is already a very complex issue. The reason why we haven't had major tax reform legislation since 1986 is because it's very complicated and it's very hard because there's so many interests at play. You put, you put health care into that toxic stew, uh, it, it gets even worse. So I would hope they don't move in that direction, but it would not surprise me to see the, the political pressure continue to force Republicans to try and come back to ACA repeal before we get into the heart of election season uh, next spring. And, and as the Trump sage, is, is that something that the president would be pushing, do you think, to bring health care back in that way alongside tax reform, tack it on to budget reconciliation, as you say? Yeah, I mean, I think the president is certainly open to that based on what I've heard. But I, I look, I think I, I, the president's not particularly ideological when it comes to these things or anything for that matter. Um, I think that really what the president wants is he wants to be able to say they got something done. And he recognizes as well as anybody does that health care is an issue that animates the Republican base, that the Republican base cares deeply about whether there is something uh, done on the ACA. And so to the extent that he sees that opportunity, he's going to continue fighting for it. The president wasn't particularly engaged, frankly. Uh, in the in the repeal and replace effort, even through the Graham County, he got a little more engaged on Graham Cassidy. The vice president was very engaged. But, you know, there is nothing to substitute for a president fully weighing in. You think about how involved President Obama was in the process around the ACA. Contrast that with where President Trump was. And then the one last thing I'll say is this. If President Trump had had during his campaign a plan of his own to repeal and replace the ACA, this issue would have been litigated more fully during the campaign. They would have been able to hit the ground running. The fact that they didn't have a plan put them way behind the eight ball, and it totally messed up the process, which is why you had all these process arguments, why everything looked so ham-handed, because they did not have a campaign plan, and they didn't have a transition plan. And so as we head into 2018 um, and elections, how... How do you think this this plays out? I don't know if that's something you could talk a little bit about from your from your polling or. Uh, so first, uh, for people in the healthcare world, you would wish that your issue was not so political. <laughs> so l let me just describe the numbers that if you're in the House or Senate. Uh, so a year from November, uh, two thirds, uh, uh, excuse me, one third of the Senate, two th uh, the whole House, the whole House. is up for re-election. Only 40 percent of adults vote in that election. I'm sorry. And in the primaries, where you used to have like Harvard tenure, once you made it past the eighth year, they never challenged you. Now you have people coming out of the woodwork. Only 20% of adults decide that they want to spend the day in a primary vote. So what you're looking at is not the aggregate America, where we go with health care. You're looking at who is going to come out in my Republican uh, primary. And if you look at the data for people in the House, most of them want one more fight at this bill. They re and the idea that we held hands and it was like the UN, uh, it, it just doesn't play well in rural Utah. So uh, we're, we're going to be stuck that the, there's a policy discussion and then there is what's going to happen when I'm running with a small number of, of people and it means a lot, lot uh, 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 to Republicans. So it's going to be hard in my view to get a, a lot unless you meet Bob's criteria, which is quite high. That is, I could run if I got what Bob said and say, look, I did these things. I just didn't settle. 
but uh, the, it's a problem about being on my side. Uh, the average American giving money to insurance companies so they can sell more things is not as exciting a political issue as you think it is. Uh, so uh, that's the political side of this. You might also mention what the uh, dynamic looks like in the Senate. Because of the 33 seats that are up, 20 plus are Democratic seats. Uh, there are very few Republicans that are up, and now we have a number of them who've declined to run again. Bob Corker is one of those. And so it's a question of who are the competitors going to be. The Alabama race that uh, Lanny mentions was a surprise not only to Mitch McConnell, but to Trump, who went down and, and spent his own capital to uh, to essentially push that candidate. So the question will be, who are the Republicans that come out and play for the 20 odd seats that are in play on the Democratic side? And none of this has anything to do with best for health care. Right. None of this, stop this best. These are people trying to figure out how will I win some state by 1%. Right. And these issues are in the middle because they're so visible. If they were not visible, we would not, you know, people wouldn't be worried about how the ad's right. going to play in rural Utah. And it will play state yeah. by state. Yes. The, the, yeah. You see one state, you have seen one state. So the dynamics in each state, yeah. all, at the end of the day, all politics are in fact local. So it will really be a question of how it plays in the state. And, and John, I just wondered maybe if um, you might be able to address this question, which is just, you know, we we're talking about the, the ferocity of the debate over the single payer, the government paid health care versus this idea of, of federalism. And I'm wondering, um, you know, as we start to see these elections come closer and there is a sort of, um, as, as Bob found in his polling, um, just a, a, a a, a, a shift, just a national shift towards single payer. Could this become a bigger political issue for 2018? Could that be a real discussion um, point that Republicans have to address? Um, I'm not sure Republicans have to address it at this point, mm -hmm. but I think they will because I think they like to address it. I think they like to talk. It's very interesting. If you poll the question, do you like Medicare for all? It's about two thirds, about 66% of Americans say it. If you say, do you like single payer health care? It's about 45% of Americans. So a huge difference, which is why you hear Bernie Sanders and Democrats say Medicare for all, and you hear uh, Senator Graham, Lindsey Graham, talking about single payer. And that's what you're going to hear all the time because it's two competing metaphors for it. I think you'll see a warm up for it in the Democratic side in the elections in 2018. But what you'll really see is this to be a, a big topic of discussion in the Democratic primary for the 2020 presidential elections. So I, if, you were, if you were betting money on what's going to be a rising issue with a rising profile, it's going to get a lot of attention. It's single payer, or Medicare for all. And to a lot of people, that's really exciting and good. Um, and to a lot of us who believe that they were really meaningful, important, incremental reforms that could really stabilize this system and help millions of Americans get more affordable coverage in the shorter term, um, it's a cause for concern for us because, you know, we saw in 1993-94 Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh, and they came out saying, we are going to change health care for all Americans. And they went for the whole shooting match. And Sheila knows this as well as anybody. They ended up with nothing. Um, and, then, and, then, uh, and, and Barack Obama pulled back significantly and said, we're not trying to get change health care for everybody. We're trying to change it for people who are uninsured, people damaged by pre-existing conditions, and a much narrower frame. And got it done. Um, so, so there are reasons to be, there are reasons for both sides to be concerned and perhaps there might be some room f to start talking about other alternatives on the table rather than just repeal and replace and go to who knows what or single payer. There's other ways to get at the problems that we face. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Thank you. Um, Lisa, did you want to go to a question? Hi, yes, yes, I would like to because we have a number coming in. <laughs> we can just take a few, I think. Um, this is from Andrew Scott from the Albany County Department of Health. 
ACA opponents have some valid concerns about grasshoppers in the system, in quotes, people not paying their fair share for health care and taking advantage of Medicaid. This seems like a massive roadblock in convincing the country to go the single-payer single route. Where do lawmakers go from here in writing legislation that eliminates that criticism? How can we as public health professionals change hearts and minds to support it? Um, Any thoughts I'd on like that? I'd to take that one. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand yeah, I'm the not question. sure I understand oh. it either. <laughs> I think it, That's the, what I'm it, saying at the John. It, I, th <laughs> I think the question is about people taking advantage of Medicaid and a, a roadblock in terms of, of people wanting to move forward with single, single payer about that and how to change perceptions about that. So I, don't, that I think that's what he's asking. I don't asking. know the second link. The first link is an ongoing issue with Medicaid and the states wanting to do work requirements and have a certain amount of commitment on the part of the individual in terms of premiums or cost sharing. A lot of the Arkansas work and others was to try and get buy-in so the individual feels some ownership and responsibility before kicking into a Medicaid support program. I'm not sure I entirely understand the, the link to single pay. I mean, the single payer issue is everybody gets covered but I, I confess I haven't heard a lot of about grasshoppers yeah, in this either. kind of, but I okay. but I'll say this that the reason why single payer is so tough and the reason why by the way it went down to massive defeats when it was on the ballot in California in 1994 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Oregon in 2002 and in Colorado in 2016 is because it falls apart on the financing when you get down to the question of, okay, yeah, I love this idea, but now how's it going to get paid for? What's going to happen to my taxes compared with what I had before? That's where, and I don't hear in the cheering squads for single payer a serious effort to try to figure out how to learn the lessons from not just California, Oregon, and Colorado, but also from Vermont where mm -hmm. they tried mm -hmm. to do it legislatively, had a full legislative and gubernatorial commitment, and couldn't, couldn't get it done and had to pull the plug once the time came to put the financing on the table. Mm -hmm. While we're on single payer, because we have had a number of questions, um, why don't I just ask this one then. How well do single payer systems work in countries that have them? I've read some stats that said in those countries, not only are costs lower, but people live longer. What are the main obstacles to making it a reality aside from the obvious issues with the tax in increases? So so the best, the best port to look at is the report from the Commonwealth Fund. Yeah. They put it out five times. The last one is just a few just months ago. It's called Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Mm -hmm. And I remind my students a lot. You know, they took 11 s countries, advanced countries, mm -hmm. and did apples to apples comparisons among the 11. And every one of the five times they've done it, the U.S. has come in dead last. But I remind my students that the second worst system time after time is the Canadian system. Canadian. So. It's, uh, you know, there are lots of ways to get to universal coverage and a rational system that works. And single payer is one way, and there's also the way of Germany, Switzerland, mm -hmm. Netherlands, Netherlands, other countries that have better levels of satisfaction and quality than Canada or certainly the United States and don't have to do it going the whole way to single payer. There's other ways to get there. And as I recall, the rate of increase in terms of cost is not terribly dissimilar. The base is lower, but essentially the costs are increasing not dissimilar yes. because we're all dealing with an aging population. But Lanny, you were going to comment as well. No, yeah, no, I, th I think all, all good points. I think if you look at the Canadian system or the British system, uh, you know, even systems that are, that, that have, you know, high, social, high sort of socialization of costs, you see still a significant role in many of those systems for private uh, insurers or for secondary insurance markets. And, and the cost issue is really important that other countries are struggling with this as well. You know, some of the highest performing systems are, are more hybrid systems, whether it's Switzerland, Germany, Singapore, uh, the Singaporean system, which I've done a fair amount of work on, it, it is held out as an example. Now, it's tough to compare a small city state like Singapore to uh, a large nation like ours. But the one thing I think policymakers need to do a little more of in this country is they need to do a little bit more looking outside of America for examples of what works and what doesn't. We don't do nearly enough. 
Great, thank you. I'll take one more and then we can ask our audience if they have any questions. Um, we have had a number of questions about women's health. Uh, so just to represent that, I'll take this. Can you summarize the general impacts on women's health coverage of the various GOP efforts to repeal and replace? And there have been questions about Planned Parenthood and that sort of thing as well. Well, I would just simply say that Planned Parenthood, funding of Planned Parenthood, is not funding of women's health necessarily. It's a question of whether, in fact, they want to fund abortion. I mean, so I think we have to separate this out, right? It's a different issue. Uh, with regard to the Planned Parenthood matter, obviously that was one of the sticking points for uh, Senator Collins, and uh, because one, that was one of the things, and as a result, uh, it basically ended up uh, in killing the Graham-Cassidy bill. But I think with regard to women's health, I think, uh, since I have so many in my own family, I, th I think the most important thing is, are people getting the kind of health, health care they need when they need it on time? And um, I think there are some real issues in our health care system on this. Uh, I will say, you know, uh, one of the things that the Commonwealth Fund points out in their previous studies, uh, you know, which I, I have some methodological issues with it. But nevertheless, they point out that the United States uh, has a high degree of responsiveness uh, with regard to health care issues. And if you are suffering, for example, from breast cancer, in the United, if you're in the United States, you're probably in a better place uh, in the United States than other places around the world. The other thing is the health care quality in the United States is highly uneven. If you are involved in a health care plan, you know, offered by a large employer, usually a large employer plan, your health care is pretty good, depending upon where you are. If you're in Boston, Massachusetts, or Washington, D.C., or Baltimore, Maryland, you have access to Brigham and Women's Hospital, you have access to Johns Hopkins University or Georgetown Medical Center, and your quality is terrific. If you're in a rural area in the United States, regardless of your sex or your gender, regardless of all that, your quality of care is probably not as good. And, you know, God forbid, if you end up in the Medicaid program, uh, all the evidence that I have seen indicates that your health outcomes are, in fact, inferior with regard to access to care and also medical outcomes in terms of the treatment that people get and uh, the results of, of their uh, enrollment in uh, those programs. Uh, I'd like to disagree with <coughs> Bob on a couple of points. One is with respect to Planned Parenthood. Uh, in fact, there are a host of services provided to women, um, not simply um, those related to um, uh, pregnancy termination, but a broad range of screening and uh, a variety of other things that have been provided in many communities. But women's health care has always been an issue. I mean, it took us years to, in financing the NIH, to get them to focus on women. Uh, and we have Barbara Mikulski to thank for a lot of the work that was done with respect to making sure when they were testing out issues on breast cancer, they actually did them on women. For a long period of time, they were doing them on men. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the availability of preventive services, the availability of screening, um, it has been an issue that is over time, particularly in the Medicare program, we've added uh, services specific to women. But of course, in the context of this discussion, Medicaid plays an enormously important role uh, in the availability of s s services to low-income women and children. Uh, it is the basis upon which Medicaid was built. Uh, a, a huge percentage of births in this country are, in fact, Medicaid births. Uh, prenatal services, EPSDT, the early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment programs within the Medicaid program. So the extent to which you reduce coverage uh, in the public sector in terms of public programs, it has a, a potential of having an enormous impact on women. Um, there have been a lot of questions about just the Medicaid expansion and what to expect with that. And I'm just wondering if you all want to comment on that. So it's uh, 31 states have expanded as the ACA permits and the Supreme Court agreed it should work. 19 states have still not. The last state to expand was about a year and a half ago. Louisiana was the last one, 31. And I don't see, at this point, I don't see an inch of movement in any of the 19 states to move. And, and noteworthy, Florida and Texas coming out of the hurricanes and all of the people who were damaged in there and not an inch of movement in terms of providing some coverage that's 
available just with the flick of a switch for people in those states. So I don't see much happening right now. If those 19 states came in, uh, that would result in about another three to five million people getting coverage. Uh, we've gotten health insurance according to the census. Uh, the rate of uninsurance is the lowest it's ever been, about 8.8 percent. Um, this would take it down another three to five million. So there's an opportunity there, but I think it is, again, just another example of how we are just stuck as a nation in terms of moving forward and figuring out how to continue to make progress. And it's just really unfortunate and sad, particularly for all the low-income people in those states who can't get coverage. Thank you. Um, well, I think we've come to the near conclusion of our panel. So um, in 30 seconds or less, um, I'll just go down the row and ask for one last policy takeaway from each of you. And um, Lenny, I, I think I'd like to start with you this time. Well, thanks for uh, putting this program together. I, I, the healthcare continues to be a remarkably politically charged issue, but it really shouldn't be. If you think about the implications for people, you think about the implications for budgets and all these other important issues that we uh, have to deal with. The, the one thing I would say uh, to John's last comment about Medicaid expansion is, I, I do think that it will become increasingly difficult for states to continue to hold out because there is significant fiscal incentive going forward to take the Medicaid expansion. And so even though we haven't seen movement in the short term, I do tend to think that more and more states that have not been part of the Medicaid expansion are going to be uh, very tempted to come in. Uh, but again, we come back to politics. And so I, I, I would hope we can make some productive headway over the next few months. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not overly optimistic that that's going to happen. Great. Thanks. And John, perhaps you next? I guess I'd just like to know two things quickly. One is it's uh, really to thank the Trump administration and the Republican leaders in Congress for putting this issue on the table because there's a saying what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and uh, the ACA has probably never had more public confidence and more understanding and acceptance. Look at the Jimmy Kimmel example than what we've seen over the past. I mean, people who didn't really understand pre-existing conditions. People had no idea what an essential health benefit was. Uh, and now there is just incredible understanding and the resilience of people all over the country through the Indivisible Movement and through the other grassroots organizations who have just stood up to defend what has been gained has just been extraordinary. Bob? Well, I uh, disagree. I don't think that Jimmy Kimmel is the standard for health policy analysis for America. But I would say this, that uh, we've learned a lot, but it is, uh, we're we keep talking about how we're debating health care. Actually, we're not debating health care. If we were debating health care, we would be de debating things like diet, exercise, nutrition, all of those things which actually contribute to health. What we're actually engaged in here is a political science debate. And that political science debate is ultimately who makes the decisions in the system about the key health care decisions that you are going that, that affect your life. At the end of the day, that's really it. Uh, it's going to be a question about whether, in fact, you're going to have government officials make determinations about what kind of plan you get, what kind of benefits you get, what kind of medical procedures and treatments that are available to you, or whether, in fact, you will be able to exercise control not only over the decisions, but also the dollars to enforce those decisions. Frankly, we've got a long way to go. This debate is not going to, con is, is not going to end, I think, over the next two years or the next four years. This is a process, basically. It's not an event. No single legislative, uh, uh, no single legislative action is going to end this debate. But I think there are some very, very major decisions that this country is going to have to make. We've got an aging population. We've got very, very serious demands on us. And uh, we have to make sure that we use the best resources that we have, both public and private, to get the best value for our health care dollars. We're not doing that now. <coughs> uh, and that, and frankly, it seems to me, is the major uh, objective of public policy going forward. 
Thank you. Sheila. I think Bob's correct. That this debate is not over. I think many of the issues Bob raises are legitimate issues that need to be dealt with in terms of the role of government and the relationship in the health care system. Uh, but my concern at the moment is the current stabilization issues that we need to deal with in the very short run that allow us to continue that conversation, allow us to talk about value, allow us to talk about essentially the relationship between individuals and states and the federal government. Uh, but I think we need to do that in an environment where people aren't fearful of losing their coverage in the near term. Bob? Uh, so my apologies again. Uh, w the overall settlement of where we're going will actually turn out in the 2020 election. And uh, uh, President Trump will run as the most polarizing president probably in a century. The reason why we can't reach agreement is that people in politics are not sure who's going to show up, how intense they're going to be, what they're going to want. And so one is pictures of thousands of angry young people who never voted getting even. The other is rural people in pickup trucks turning out like they never did before. When that election's over, you're going to look at that and people are going to say, let's read some agreement here and move on. But until that is over, we are stuck that people who are looking at politics cannot figure out what this polarization from the White House in politics is going to mean. And that doesn't lend itself to big, broad, sweeping settlements, if you're not sure uh, what that you know, day after November is. After that, I really think the next panels after that will all be on policy. We will not be who is running where. Uh, for it. But till then, we are really stuck in what is this event in American history going to mean for the future. Thanks so much for coming today. Thanks for joining us, our experts. I think you proved yourself. Um, uh, I just want to encourage anyone viewing right now to continue this conversation on the forum website, forumhsph.org, and also to tune in for our next forum event, Addressing Climate Change, State and Corporate Perspectives in a Time of Budget Cuts. That's on October 13th from noon to 1, and is also being presented jointly with Reuters. Thanks very much. Thank you.